so hello again. <laughs> so this is Ian. He'll be helping me with the presentation today. So today I'm going to be talking about heterogeneous compute. And this is a generic term for GPU computation coming in Max. So I want to recap the keynote. So Max now runs on GPUs. And this means that all the powers of Max that you've heard throughout this conference about CPUs just work on the GPU. And so this talk is kind of split into two parts. What it means for the end-to-end -end developer that just wants to run their model, and then what it means to the Mojo developer or the people that are writing kernels and so on. So let's start with what it means to the end-to-end -end developer. Well, as you kind of imagine, everything just works seamlessly. In fact, you only have to change one single line, right? So I tried to show this in the, actually, this is a video that did not work in the keynote and it's not gonna work today. Uh, so, hey, thank you. Uh, so what I was showing in the keynote is we have built a website where we can type in a query, and this is running on the Mac CPU, and we can just toggle a little button, and it's gonna go flash super green. Right? And then I'm gonna type in the query again, how to make llamas fast, and it's such a fast response. It's super, super fast. But you get a lot more by using, kind of transitioning your code to run on the GPU. You're getting all the CPU features to carry onto the GPU, like quantization, extensibility, performance, et cetera. Now, what does it mean to the developer? So this, these are folks that are actually in the weeds writing CUDA code. So let's look at the current workflow. So the current workflow, what people do to integrate kernels into that runs on the GPU is they have to write some CUDA C++ code, their kernels, have to wrap it in C++ code. That's like launch the kernel, you know, do mem copy to and from to the GPU, and just write a wrapper in Python or PyBind or something to expose that to the frameworks. And along the way, they also have to use a bunch of tools. At the CUDA side, they have to use MVCC or other kind of compilers. And C++ side, they have to use, you know, Clang or GCC, Python, you know, there's like 50 projects to compile Python code. They're packaged it up. It's not clear which one is the best right now. Obviously, Mojo unifies this all into one thing. You only write Mojo code. You can export it to your framework, you know, to the Max framework via the accessibility mechanism. You can write Mojo code in, that runs on CPUs. You can write Mojo code that runs on GPUs, etc. And the other thing I want to mention is Max on GPUs. So because Max is built on the full power of Mojo, that means you have the full power of LLVM, MLIR, and hardware. There was a question earlier about that, and I want to emphasize that. And that means you can also like just program. You know, the programming model for Max on GPU is meet you where you are. If you want to write threadindex.x and blockindex.x, you can easily do that. You can just write it as if you're writing CUDA C++ code. So this means the familiar SIMT programming model and so on. This is a Mandelbrot code, for example. And there's no magic here. So one thing that we've made sure is all the kind of, um, all the implementation details is lifted into the library. This is our definition of thread index.x. It's calling an LLVM intrinsic, which means you could do the same thing. You can override it if you want. One fun thing to do is for April Fools, you can change thread index.x definition to be thread index.y and you know, like get the bug report. Obviously, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> but it also means you have full hardware access. So there's a lot of things that don't have LVM intrinsics or they might exist in other things. This is the shuffle instruction. It's eventually calling an LVM intrinsic, but I could have called you know, an inline PTX and so on. And what that means, because you have this full power, is you can remix and define your own libraries. 
use intrinsic inline PTX tensor cores, build the hierarchy of libraries that you want. Now, programming in this low level is great, but after that, you want to build abstractions. So nobody wants to write thread index.x and so on. It's just super you know, low level. You have the ability to do that, but you know, in many cases, you don't want to do that. So we built a lot of abstractions. So let's look at this Mandel broth thing again. We have a function called elementwise that applies the same function on every element in some domain. Notice here that I have target equals CUDA. If I set target equals CPU, the same code will just run on the CPU. No changes otherwise. Now we could probably automate this and actually max automates that by just when you say device equals CUDA, it makes all the operations run on the GPU. But there's a lot more. One challenge that people have is they have CPU code that then they have to port into CUDA code. Mojo code, the CPU code is shared between the CPU and the GPU. There's no changes necessary. This is the Mandelbrot code that we showed in the blog post a few months ago. And this is the same code that's running on the GPU. And actually, Ian will show you uh, that a bit more. But there's a lot more. Mojo enables prototyping, researching, and iterating on your GPU code. This is a kind of a schism that happens where you have CPU code experts and GPU code experts. And to show a lot of that, let me introduce Ian again, and he's going to dive into that in more details. Thanks, Abdul. Before jumping into the demo, I just wanted to reiterate some important considerations for AI researchers and developers. First is that they're most productive working in a single language. It's difficult to be proficient in multiple languages at the same time, and it's even harder to interoperate between them. And Mojo kind of just defines that away by being able to uh, run on any device within Mojo. Another important consideration is fast iteration time. Mojo enables that by fast compilation times, fast kernels, and kind of this quick real-time feedback loop that's promoted through using Jupyter Notebooks, which I'm going to show in a second. Thirdly, you want access to libraries, which Mojo provides through the Python interop. You can call any Python package uh, to do anything you want. You don't have to write it in pure Mojo. And then the final consideration, which is important for researchers especially, is that it, you want to be able to easily share and communicate code. And Mojo enables this again through uh, Jupyter Notebooks and through uh, kind of platform independent Mojo packages. So let me jump, jump into the Jupyter demo. So I'll just be showing a simple Mandelbrot kernel written in Mojo, executing inside a Jupyter Notebook. And I'll just start by importing some Mojo packages and then defining a plotting function. And the plotting function just calls into Python's matplotlib library. So we don't need to write in any of that ourselves. And then Abdul just showed this, but let's take a look at the actual kernel that runs on the GPU. Uh, and the Mandelbrot set, for those who don't know, it's the set of complex numbers that satisfy some function. And it's well suited to the GPU because it's compute bound. Uh, it's embarrassingly parallel because all of the points are independent. And it also lends itself well to kind of oversubscription, which the GPU is able to do very, very efficiently. And so at the top, we have the kernel that's running per point in the complex plane. And then on the bottom, we have the code that maps the GPU threads to points in the plane or pixels in the image. And as Abdul already mentioned, you can go as low down as you want. Here we're using the familiar, if you've used CUDA before, same T model where you're using the thread IDX and block IDX. But of course, we have abstractions on top of that. You don't always need to write that. So I'll execute the cell that I just talked about. And then within the Jupyter Notebook, you also get you know, highlighting of global aliases and all these other nice features. And then this is the code that uses Mojo's built-in benchmark utility to benchmark the kernel. We have full document auto-completion, and I'm going to set the benchmark to run for two seconds. And then this code is going to compile the GPU kernel, um, and then it's going to benchmark it. And then finally, I will plot it using the uh, matplotlib function that we already defined. And you get a beautiful picture of the Mandelbrot set, and you can also see that it executes in 2.3 milliseconds. And so next, I'm going to show that you can just uh, re-execute one of the cells, re recompile the kernel, and then have it run again. And in this case, we're going to get a small speed up. So as Abdul mentioned, what I'm going to do is copy in a vectorized version of the inner Mandelbrot kernel. This comes straight from the CPU code. And then we're also going to, just for fun, change the color of the plot. And we're going to re-execute all of the 
uh, all of the cells and get a new image. And as you can see, we actually sped it up in this case by using the vectorized SIMD code with no changes, and we get a different color, obviously, as expected. And you might be thinking to yourself, who cares about Mandelbrot? And uh, that's a very fair point. So in order to prove this out more, we wrote a flash attention to kernel entirely in Mojo. And so as Abdul already showed in the keynote, the core algorithm for flash attention two fits in one slide and it's very Pythonic. So here we're using keyword arguments, uh, multiple argument uh, declarations. Uh, you don't have to specify types anywhere. And at the same time, we're using compile time parameters in order to generate efficient assembly code. And um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the core of the flash attention kernel two, flash attention two kernel uh, written in Mojo. And you might think, do these abstractions have a cost? And on the next slide, we'll show that they don't. But I also just wanted to mention here, you'll, you'll notice you don't see the thread IDX or block IDX stuff, and that's because we've abstracted those details away into these block level routines that are defined in the library. So these element-wise operations you see, they're operating on blocks, not individual values. And so just to verify that these uh, abstractions are indeed zero cost, we can see a plot of the performance against uh, Triton on A100 using float32, and on average, it was 2x faster. Uh, now, one issue with GPU kernels is that they're, uh, they can be difficult to debug and to optimize. And NVIDIA has developed a ton of amazing tools in order to make this process easier. And those tools work out of the box at Mojo. So I just wanted to show an example of using Insight Compute. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a uh, kernel profiling tool that gives you access to low-level performance counters on the GPU. And I'll show how we can use that to do a simple optimization on the flash attention kernel that we just looked at. So here I'm gonna just build an executable uh, of the flash attention kernel. And you can see that it compiles to an executable called flash. And then we're going to run that and see that it takes 2.25 milliseconds. And now I'm gonna capture an NSYS trace of the kernel by re-executing it. We'll load that in a moment. And then finally, I'm gonna build another version of the kernel with debug info enabled, and that's gonna allow us to map the Mojo source code to the NVIDIA PTX and SAS in the Insight Compute tool. Okay, I just finished the comp compilation there. And now we're gonna load the first trace I captured, which is an NSYS trace in the Insight Compute UI. And here we can see a high level view of all of the GPU activity. And we're going to zoom in to the flash attention kernel that executes on the right-hand side there. And just by double-clicking on it, we can actually uh, drill down into the detailed performance metrics here. So I'm going to launch another profiling session. And so that's just uh, re-executing um, the executable that we generated earlier. And here we have access to all of the performance metrics that you'd need to do optimizations. And we're gonna look at the source code, the mapping between the Mojo code and the PTX. So the Mojo code is on the left and the PTX is on the right. And I'll just click into uh, a few functions that are interesting here. So here we've jumped into the entry point of the flash attention kernel. And then now we're gonna look at some of those block level operations that we defined in the library. So here we're getting the block IDX. The programmer doesn't worry about that, but obviously in the, uh, actually in this case, they need to use that. But let's look at the block wise multiply instruction. Uh, and we can see the block wise max, which uses the shuffle instruction that Abdul introduced earlier, which is just a library abstraction. And then if we look at some of these performance metrics, we see that 44% of the instructions are inside this MMA routine. And so we should take a closer look at that to see if there are any issues there. There, And immediately there's an obvious issue, which is that we're spilling registers. So we're loading from local memory instead of using registers, which is a performance problem. And that's because we've exceeded uh, the max number of registers that are available. So on the next slide, I applied a, a fix, uh, which I won't get into the details of, but I'll apply that fix and then recompile uh, the Mojo executable, again with debug info enabled, and let's just verify that we've removed uh, the register spilling issue by looking at the source code again. So we'll just do one more profile. Should 
jump to the flash attention kernel. And then if we look at the MMA routine, now we have this uh, unrolled sequence of uninterrupted FMAs, and there's no loads from local memory. So we fixed the issue that we found, which was much easier thanks to the Insight Compute tool. And now as a final uh, exercise, we'll just reprofile the kernel to make sure that it sped things up. So I'll jump into the command line again, rebuild the Mojo kernel. You can see how fast it is. Re-execute it, and it takes 1.87 milliseconds. So that was actually about a 25% speed up over the previous uh, implementation that we had. And so I'm just showing Insight Compute here, but we've also used other NVIDIA tools during our GPU bring up. So another one that's been very important is the Compute Sanitizer. So that identifies race conditions in device code, and we've been able to get really nice stack traces uh, that point us directly to the issues in the Mojo source code. And now I'll hand it back over to Abdul. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Ian. So as I mentioned, that's not all. Again, all the CPU features carries over to the max GPU. So because we've built a unified stack, a lot of this, you know, everything just carries over. We're not like defining two things at the same time, we're defining one thing. And we're just getting started. Actually, Ian, I have a question. How long have you been, I know you've been developing CUDA for a while, but how long have you been using Max GPU? I wrote my first Mojo GPU kernel about three weeks ago, actually. Interesting. So actually, I'm more senior. So I've been programming CUDA since like CUDA version one, but my Mojo GPU experience have been about four weeks. In fact, we brought up this entire stack in around four weeks. This is very massive, and this shows a lot of the flexibility that both Mojo and Max bring. Being very hardware agnostics enables very fast GPU bring up. So we're just getting started. We've announced an NVIDIA partnership earlier today to bring Mojo across the stack to all NVIDIA offerings, and that will be available in Q1 2024. We're also gonna announce a lot more exciting things. So give us a few months. We're gonna be excited to announce a lot more cool things at GTC 2024. So with that, I wanna open it up for questions.